The basic 2018 Nissan GTR Pure starts at $101,685, including destination. The cheapest model still seems like a steal with a base price around $100k. The premium trim, the next step up, adds an 11-speaker audio system, active noise cancellation and active sound enhancement systems, and a titanium exhaust system. It starts at $112,185. Up next is the GTR Track Edition, in its second year of availability, with a starting price of $130,185. The Track Edition adds additional adhesive bonding, which helps increase rigidity. Nismo tuning for the independent suspension, with reduced weight and additional roll stiffness. And Dunlop tires. It also comes with a dry carbon fiber rear spoiler and unique interior bits, including Recaro seats. Finally, the big dog, known as the GTR Nismo, gets 600 horsepower, as opposed to 565 horsepower on the other trims, and 481 pounds FT, as opposed to 467, from the same twin turbocharged 3.8 liter V6. It starts at an eye-watering $177,185. It will be produced in limited numbers, we've asked Nissan, how limited? And gets optimized aerodynamics, suspension and powertrain. The 2018 Nissan GTR is on sale now. It's old. It weighs as much as an apartment building. It doesn't have the fancy badge that usually comes with its price tag. Despite all that, the Nissan GTR is still still one of the fastest cars in the world, capable of beating giants in the six and even seven figure price range. It's not cheap either, but for 2018, it can be had for a bigger discount than we've seen in years. Nissan recently announced pricing for the 2018 GTR, and it comes with a new model called the GTR Pure which can be yours for just $99,990. You still get that 3.8-liter twin-turbo V6 rated at 565 horsepower and 467 pounds FT of torque and the ability to go from a stop to 60 mph in 3 seconds or less, but you do without some comforts like the Bose sound system, active noise system and titanium exhaust. Do you need those things on your GTR anyway? Of course not. This is a good move. Over a number of years, the GTR significantly grew in price from when it originally launched in 2008. The first R35 had a base price of just $69,850, but until now the base price was over $100,000. The GTR Track Edition is almost $130,000 while the world-killing Nismo version is $175,000. The supercar killer eventually got a supercar price tag of its own. Now, $99,990 is just barely under the six-figure mark, and it's a little over that with the destination fees and such. But it means Godzilla is slightly more of a bargain again and that makes us happy. You should go out and buy four of them immediately. Subaru has launched the WRX STI Final Edition, a limited run special to celebrate the end of the brand's legendary motorsport hone flagship model. The car has been upgraded mechanically with larger brakes housed behind 19 and wheels and a multi-mode driver's control center differential to help with cornering agility. Subaru says the WRX STI will not be produced anymore as the brand's performance pinnacle and it will instead use the car as inspiration for future models. Despite this, Subaru produced a striking concept for the Tokyo Motor Show that appeared to foreshadow a next-generation performance car akin to the WRX STI. The Visive Performance Concept if it reaches production, will go on sale under a new name following the announced death at the WRX STI. Marking out the final edition WRX STI on the outside are a redesigned front bumper and the final edition badge. The brake calipers are painted yellow. The interior has also been upgraded, with gloss black trim and red highlights. 
The infotainment screen has grown to 5.9 and in the instruments are revised. This special edition car costs £33,995, which is £2,000 more than the standard WRX STI. Orders are being taken now. A sad day? Bad day? Maybe even a long overdue day? Whatever way you look at it, it has finally come and Subaru is waving a teary goodbye to the WRX STI, the last in the line of fast Imprezas that stretches all the way back to late 1992. If ever a car caught the zeitgeist, this was it. As the World Rally Championship had recovered from the ban on Group B monsters like the Audi Quadro Sport, Ford RS200 and Lancia Delta S4, more showroom-based cars had taken a while to catch the enthusiasm of fans. By the early 1990s, there was a buzz back in the forests and rally spectators were treated to some brilliant sights they could also get their hands on to drive themselves. Subaru's first effort in this direction was based on the legacy and it proved extremely useful in the hands of Carlos Sainz, Richard Burns and, of course, Colin McRae. The legacy gave McRae his first WRC victory, so it was down to Carlos Sainz to give the 1994 Impreza WRC its maiden win. That year coincided with the Japanese firm deploying its Subaru Technica International Division to take its performance cars to the next level. With the letters STI now firmly associated with the Impreza, it turned into a dream year in 1995 as Colin McRae lifted the world driver's title and Subaru lifted the manufacturer's gong, setting up a hat-trick for the following two years. The key point in all of this is that Subaru won on Sunday and sold on Monday. And boy did they sell. In the UK, 35% of all Subaru sales were made up of the Impreza Turbo 2000 in saloon and sport hatch shapes. Not even Volkswagen could claim that sort of market penetration with its Golf GTI. Even more impressive, Subaru achieved this when Mitsubishi was also hot on its heels with the various Lancer Evolution models. We couldn't get enough of these cars and it seemed there was a symbiotic relationship between them and the popularity of rallying. Then, it all started to slow down. Colin McRae moved drives to Ford and then Citroën, the cars became more sophisticated, and Sebastian Loeb assumed the dominance of the sport that made it all too predictable for many. Not Loeb's fault his genius was so overpowering, but it didn't make for much of a rally when it was a race for second spot. Worse was to come when Subaru launched replacements for the original Impreza that were less than easy on the eye. Quick facelifts mitigated this to some extent, but the magic was gone. Our love affair with the Impreza had fizzled out and with that so did sales. Those figures failed to recover when Subaru introduced the hatchback model in 2007. It continued with rallying as a means to promote the car, but it just wasn't the same. Not even Ken Block's hooligan antics could muster much interest in this dumpy-looking machine. What seemed like an ignominious end for the fast Impreza was staved off with the launch of a new four-door saloon WRX STI in 2010, but by then it was too little too late. The world had moved on, hot hatches were back in favor and a new breed of affordable performance cars with premium badges from Porsche, BMW, Audi and Mercedes had all become well established. And now we find ourselves here, with Subaru's announcement this week that they will be saying farewell to this brand icon and marking the end of Subaru's heritage in the UK with the release of 150 WRX STI Final Edition models. The Swansong WRX STI Final Edition bows out as more of a lament than a furious raging against the inevitable. Sure, 150 die-hard fans will snap them up and enjoy this car's rarity and performance. The rest of us? We'll just carry on as normal because if we fancy a ruckus all-wheel drive hatch with the pace to upset supercar drivers, we're not short on options. A quick scan of the market shows we are blessed with the Audi S3 and RS3, 
Ford Focus RS, Mercedes A45 AMG and Volkswagen Golf R. All of these can be leased at very reasonable monthly rates, which puts them at an advantage over the Subaru which has proven to be more expensive to rent and run than its rivals. But this leads us to ask the question, if these cars carry on finding favor with drivers, how come the Subaru missed the boat when it had once dominated the market it created? The simple answer is the Impreza and its derivatives just didn't move with the times. Having caught the wave of popular imagination in the mid-1990s with help from McRae, Burns, Sainz and Peter Solberg, the Japanese firm didn't keep with the shifting demands of buyers. While many loved the rawness of the cars, as they grew up and needed more from the cars Subaru didn't grow with them. Nor did Subaru bother to launch a diesel engine in any of its cars when the market was shifting in this direction throughout the early 2000s. Myers may have wanted an STI, but family and work often meant a more mundane engine choice was necessary and Subaru was way too late to that party. So sales floundered, the image waned and, when old Impresas became cheap enough, they fell into the less than caring hands of boy racers. Bang, the image and luster of these cars was gone for good. The only bright spot on the horizon for the superbly compact high-performance cars is they are now regarded as modern classics and prices are on the up for unmolested examples. They're also still easy enough to live with and maintain that you can use them every day as an alternative to a modern car. Mind you, most owners now molly cuddle them and wisely choose a new car for daily duties. The irony is that many of these new lease cars are the likes of the aforementioned Focus RS, Golf and S3 that Subaru did so much to bring about in the first place. That's not a bad legacy to leave behind, so we should be glad the Subaru Impreza Turbo 2000, WRX and STI models existed in the first place. Gone soon but never forgotten, Subaru has hinted some of the STI DNA will be carried forward into new models so there's hope for the future.